Good morning to all of you from Washington, D.C. I'm Karen Donfrey with GMF, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event about strengthening youth leadership and democracy across Europe and Eurasia. In 2019, USAID's Europe and Eurasia Bureau, the International Republican Institute, and the National Democratic Institute launched the European Democracy Youth Network. EDYN, creating a new coalition of political and civic leaders with a shared commitment to democratic principles. It is wonderful to be joined by the key officials of those three organizations today, as well as by three EDEN participants. GMF has invested in leadership development for nearly 40 years now. Our alumni community consists of over 4,000 leaders with whom we engage actively, and that community spans the United States and Europe, from Anchorage to Yerevan. Recently, we've expanded our work to Europe's eastern neighborhood, thanks to support from Germany's KFW Development Bank, and we've launched two of our longstanding fellowship programs, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship and the Transatlantic Inclusion Leaders Network there, along with two new fellowship programs to help young emerging talent build their leadership profile and hone their leadership skills. We know how high the need in the region is, which is why we are thrilled about initiatives such as Eden to further advance the region's leadership potential. All of our organizations are working together on this critically important goal. Today, we want to focus on transatlantic efforts to support emerging leaders and strengthen networks in Europe and Eurasia at this time of tremendous turbulence. Our program will kick off with opening remarks from our friends at USAID, NDI, and ILI. Our discussion will be enriched by the participation of three EDEN members from Belarus, Serbia, and Poland, who will discuss the current and future challenges they face in strengthening democracy in their communities. So with that, I want to turn to my three counterparts, and I'm going to start with Brock Bierman. Brock has served as USAID's Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Europe and Eurasia since January of 2018. He has held previous leadership positions with the Rhode Island House of Representatives, USAID, FEMA, the Interior Department, and the private sector. And he has extensive knowledge of the region. We at GMF have so enjoyed working with Brock on these issues we share a passion for. So with Brock, Brock, with that, let me pass the baton to you. Thank you very much, Karen. And, and thanks to GMF uh, and all of your help and support and, and uh, uh, giving us this uh, platform today to talk about this incredibly important initiative. Uh, I also want to take a chance to, uh, or take an opportunity to thank Jonathan Katz for all of his support through uh, this effort and look forward to a, a discussion as we uh, move through the panel. Uh, but first, I also want to recognize both Dan at IRI and Derek and NDI, and just want to tell you how much of a pleasure it's been working with both of your, your organizations and uh, your teams. Your teams have been unbelievable, incredible. Uh, they've been great mentors for our young political leaders, uh, our Eden members, and uh, you know we've just begun uh, to see uh, the success, and I'm sure that uh, this will have uh, uh, change, or we'll see, we'll see change for generations to come. But I, I truly believe that right now, it is more important than ever to support the next generation of leaders. Uh, democracy in Eastern, in, uh, Eastern Europe uh, and Central Asia is far, some, far from secured. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think this is probably the most pivotal time uh, for the development of democracy. Uh, we cannot uh, give young political leaders, young civic leaders enough support. The next generation of leaders will need to be engaged more than any time in history, and we need to give them the support they need. It's, uh, it's no secret that we live in a very polarized world, and finding common ground has uh, become very difficult, but it has to be a top priority. And working with our young political leaders 
uh, to help them find that common ground and to work across the board to help all constituencies is more critical than ever. Of course, democracy uh, spurs debate and differences, but it's just essential that we understand each other's perspective and work to find solutions. I, I, you know, I, I understand there's always going to be a disagreement. D democracy by its very nature creates a debate, but we have to keep in mind the very essence of that democracy and its core, that it is to help the entire constituency, not one segment of society. It reminds me, frankly, of a quote from one of our uh, of, of United States founding father, Ben Franklin, and during the uh, development of the Declaration of De Independence, uh, where, frankly speaking, the drafting of that document would have made them all subject to hanging. And he said, we must all hang together or most assuredly we will all hang separately. And no words have ever been truer at this point. We have to work together to defeat authoritarianism, to make sure that everyone has a voice. And, and with that regard, I'm excited about the work that Eden is doing. Uh, we're going to be here to support them. I'm excited to work uh, for, uh, with uh, IRI and NDI. And you know, as I think about our role, as I think about my role, as I think about uh, my past, I also uh, think that it's important that the current generation, the generation of leaders now, are giving that opportunity to young political leaders, not only just to mentor them, but to give them a voice and to support the decision-making and the creativity that is necessary to build democracy. I, I know I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for John Chafee, who was a US Senator in Rhode Island at the time, uh, who, uh, when I was a young 20-something, walked door to door and took the time, I mean, endless amounts of time to talk to me specifically about my thoughts and my, my considerations and what we need to, to make our communities better. So with that, I, I, we're here. I uh, want to thank the uh, participants from Eden. I uh, want to tell you that there isn't a day that doesn't go by that I come to work, if you will, from my, my home now here uh, during the, the pandemic, where I've got my Eden card, if you will, my Eden card on my keyboard, where I'm looking every single day at the commonality of liberty, justice, equality, and respect for human rights. These are things we all agree on, and we're looking forward to working with all of you and having a very robust discussion on how we can continue that support. Thank you. Well, Brock, it's great to know you're a card-carrying Eden member. That's great. And to hear not only USAID's commitment to Eden, but also how your personal life experience has shown you the value of these sorts of programs. And now I'd like to turn to Derek Mitchell. Derek returned to NDI as president in September of 2018. And I say returned because two, year, two decades earlier, Derek departed NDI after having served as a senior program officer for Asia and the former Soviet Union there. Since that time, Derek has had a distinguished career in and out of the US government. And I wanna highlight that from 2012 to 2016, he served as US ambassador to the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, also known as Burma. He was America's first ambassador to the country in 22 years. And I think that experience with many others he's had has given him a unique perspective on democracy and leadership. So Derek, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Good morning, everybody here in, in the US and good afternoon, those in Europe. Good evening, if you're patching in from Asia. I wanna thank you, Karen, again. Thank you to the German Marshall Fund for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Katz, good friend, who will be moderating the panel later with the Eden representatives uh, in just a few moments. Let me just put a, send a particular shout out to Brock Bierman and USAID, who are the sponsors of Eden. You just heard from Brock. He, he, you can feel his passion. He is the beating heart of this program. Uh, I have seen it personally. I know of his passionate support for this bipartisan joint NDI IRI program. It really is inspiring. I didn't know about his card carrying, but it's not surprising. <laughs> Uh, I just want to thank Brock for all your support and for USAID for all that you're doing for this really important initiative. And let me just say I share his passion. I know that my colleague who you'll hear from in a moment, Dan Twining of IRI, feels the same way. But we are here to celebrate the next generation in Europe and Eurasia. So that's why I'm very honored also to be sharing this event with the three Eden representatives you're seeing now on the screen who are really the, the democratic, democratic hope of, of Europe. Eden is one of my favorite, very favorite initiatives. 
every time I go to Europe, I see, I meet with the Eden rep in that country. I went to three Balkan countries in four days, Eden, Eden, Eden. I went to Armenia for a couple of days, Eden, Georgia, Ukraine, Poland. Even when I was in Stockholm, I saw Eden folks. It's great. Uh, last November, I had the honor of meeting a whole gaggle of Eden folks in, in Berlin as we gathered uh, on the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at that time, I joined uh, NDI's chairman. I think many of you may be patching in remember this. Uh, I joined uh, Madeleine Albright, who is NDI's chairman, where we held a kind of town hall on democracy and discussed the future Europe that uh, leaders of Eden wanted to build. And I know she really loved that session. I loved it. And she loves to quote Robert Frost when he said, the older I get, the younger are my teachers, which is very, very true. Um, now we say next generation, and which is true, but that doesn't mean that we have to wait for some time in the future for young people to be relevant or to get involved. Uh, young people are often stereotyped as being apathetic <clears throat> or uninterested in political and civil life, civic life. From my experience, that's just simply not the case. And from NDI's experience, we just haven't found that. What we found instead is that young people just need to be engaged on issues they care about. They need to be given a voice in political life. They need the space to pursue their interests. And in fact, the youth programs are especially successful when there's a social or a community building component, which is hardly a sign of apathy. The issue though, I think, is that young people want to see real practical results from that public work. <clears throat> and they're impatient with institutions that don't deliver, that aren't agile enough to keep up with necessary change or are just plain corrupt. It's young people are dissatisfied and it's hard to blame them, but they're hardly sitting on their hands. We've all seen in recent years, young people led often by women are leading the street demonstrations in places like Hong Kong or Khartoum or Managua or Algiers or Beirut. And of course in Minsk, we have a representative here from Belarus, many other cities throughout Europe and Eurasia, uh, young people demanding to be heard and demanding change. Um, some look at this and they say, oh, there's a crisis of democracy. That's hardly the case. What young people are demanding is not less democracy, but more democracy, more transparency, more accountability, more equity, more justice, more of a voice, better democracy, not less democracy. Um, and um, I get asked often, you know, why is it that the democratic promise after the Cold War didn't live up to the expectations? And I think one of the reasons is that too often, many of the same old guys, and typically they're guys, with the same old mindsets are running things uh, generally the same old way, just under different rules. And so we're getting many of the same results over time. We need to shake it up. We need new mindsets, new faces. Uh, we need more young people who are in tune with the changes of the 21st century. Uh, we have to deal with things like climate and health crises, social divisions, economic vulnerability, New technologies are shaking up the way we all interact and get information. Young people understand this, and they understand these new technologies in particular better <clears throat> than all of us. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so NDI, for instance, has worked with members of young people in a youth group in Albania who created a video to teach citizens how to spot disinformation. In Belarus, alumni of a program we call DSCOOT formed a youth block uh, and ran for office in 2019 parliamentary elections. Many of those same folks have been active in the historic movement for change right now in Belarus at great personal risk. I just wanna say I, we wish them all well, we pray for their well-being in their struggle for justice. In the Visegrad countries, we've, we've worked with traditionally marginalized Roma as well as non-Roma youth who are working together to break down ethnic stereotypes to improve the lives of all young people. This is all critical stuff. And we all have to remember, this is not new, that young people were at the forefront of actions that helped bring down the authoritarian regimes and led to historic changes in Central and Eastern Europe 30 years ago. But I would contend that the active participation of youth in the political life of the region is as critical today as it ever was. NDI works with youth in more than 120 programs worldwide. We have across all geographic regions to support them playing a more active role in building democracy. Um, but often what we find is that what young people need most is to know they are not alone, that their democratic energy is shared. That's why networks like Eden are so important. 
And I know for certain that NDI, in partnership with USAID, with IRI, with the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, and others, will remain committed to promoting and strengthening bold youth leadership in Europe and Eurasia through Eden for years to come. So thanks again to Brock. Thank you, USAID. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, GMF, Jonathan, everyone, the three representatives from Eden right out there, and everyone listening and watching. It really is an honor to be associated with this. And let me finally conclude with a shout out to all those Eden representatives patching in from abroad. As, as Brock said, hang together, keep energized, keep focused, keep engaged, and keep fighting. Thank you. Eric, thanks so much. I mean, first, it was great to hear that everywhere you go in Europe and Eurasia, you run into Eden. That's fantastic. And secondly, your point that this next generation isn't just important for our future, but is important to our present and the impatience that that generation feels with systems that aren't delivering today, that that's leading them to demand change and work toward change is really inspiring for all of us. So thank you. And now I wanna to turn to Dan Twining, last but certainly not least. Dan joined IRI as president in September of 2017. IRI's gain was GMF's loss because Dan had been part of my team here at GMF before taking on this key leadership role at IRI. Dan has impressive experience in government, having served on the Secretary of State's planning staff as foreign policy advisor to the late Senator John McCain and at the U.S. Trade Representative. So Dan, it's terrific to have you with us this morning. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, uh, doing a GMF event is like coming home. And uh, <laughs> if GMF did anything for me, it was to help train me in uh, uh, a fervent and absolute commitment to democratic principles and to the kind of leadership that Karen Donfried continues to display. So I'm just so pleased to be with you today. Uh, there are so many people to thank. I'll be very brief because I'm looking forward to the main event, which is hearing from our friends from Eden. But really for Brock Bierman, um, Brock, you know, uh, when Thomas Jefferson left government for the last time, he was asked what were his three greatest accomplishments. And actually they weren't what people expected. Um, I think Eden, your support and your vision for Eden and this European youth movement will be one of your great legacies. So thank you. Uh, Jonathan Katz, uh, for, for anyone watching who thinks America is hopelessly polarized and divided, including around democracy issues, uh, Jonathan Katz used to help run in the Obama administration the bureau uh, that Brock Bierman now runs. So uh, Derek Mitchell runs NDI, I run IRI, Eden is uh, a partner to both of us. So if there's any confusion out there about America's commitment to democracy, I hope just the composition of uh, this group settles it, that the United States, there is broad uh, bipartisan and frankly nonpartisan commitment to supporting democracy in the world and to working with uh, rising and established Democrats all over the world. And I'm just very proud today to be with these three rising Democrats reflecting this excellent uh, network all across Europe and Eurasia that we've all had the pleasure of engaging with and interacting with and learning from. Uh, Derek Mitchell mentioned being uh, with uh, in an Eden Summit in Berlin in November. Uh, I was there also with Mark Green, who was then head of USAID and Brock Bierman, with uh, many of the Eden stars. And it, we were remembering the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Secretary Pompeo did uh, events in Berlin that week, uh, and there were many uh, celebrations. But really, I think the conversation in the Eden community, as we will hear, uh, was that the work is not done. Actually, the work of democracy is never done, and that every generation needs to fight uh, and improve democratic practice, inclusion, uh, the accountability of leaders, make sure young people have a voice. That's true in America, just as it's true in Belarus, or, or in Poland, or in Serbia, or in any of our countries. So uh, let me just very quickly make three substantive points about um, how we think about youth leadership in Europe. And I think these, these points apply more broadly uh, around the world. 
but really uh, democracy is actually coming under quite a lot of pressure in Europe in ways that might surprise the 1989 generation. And so uh, point one, I think for all of us, is that a comprehensive strategy for defending democracy in Europe must include broad support for young people, for young leaders and activists. There are many tools to counteract threats from authoritarianism, threats from autocracy, targeted sanctions, uh, diplomatic isolation, et cetera. But really we need to not be thinking tactically about individual uh, problematic leaders, individual problematic regimes to make sure that democratic gains uh, made today do not evaporate tomorrow, we need to foster the long-term growth of a culture of democratic values by supporting young leaders, that they really are the pipeline when we think about the future of democracy in any country. That's point one. Point two, Europe's democratic institutions uh, have come under a lot of pressure. Frankly, not simply from autocracy or autocrats, but from disaffected Democrats, as Derek alluded to, that democracy actually isn't working so well. And nobody is voting for autocracy, but people do want to optimize and improve their democracies. Uh, a secret ingredient to making that happen is meaningful youth participation and representation. The idea that democratic institutions in Europe are somehow out of touch is a central theme of nationalists and populists and many on both the right and left across the European political landscape but really to reconnect democratic institutions with disaffected constituencies. Political parties will have to leverage youth members uh, to adapt and to revitalize themselves. So that's point two. Point three, uh, young people have a responsibility to be active citizens. They can't simply lead it to Eden leaders, but we really need everybody to get involved here. The world is facing a host of novel and frankly unprecedented challenges. These will require new solutions, not solutions that you know, the old guard uh, has been unable to implement, but new solutions, fresh thinking. Uh, young people are going to lead in that. That's uh, everything from determining the appropriate role of social media in our democracies, the role of free speech uh, and responsible speech, to coordinating democratic solutions on crises like climate change. Uh, today's young people will be the long-term solution to the problems that afflict uh, all of us in the democracies today. So we have to remember that they are tomorrow's problem solvers and really the hope for all of us. Uh, could I just conclude, Karen, with just a quick point on Belarus? You know, we've heard a lot in the past about how uh, somehow uh, you have to have a democratic culture, or you have to have some kind of democratic inheritance. Uh, to care about human freedom, human rights, uh, political representation and accountability. The people of Belarus have made all of us so proud and inspired in these past weeks. I know Brock and Derek and Karen and everybody agrees. They are uh, inspiring the world and small d Democrats all over the world in standing up to a regime that stole an election from them. And uh, I'm just so pleased to see uh, the role of Eden members in standing up for democratic rights and principles in Belarus. And frankly, our friends in Belarus should remember that not only is the world watching and supporting them, but they are inspiring all of us uh, in ways that I think uh, this is really one of the most important developments of 2020. So uh, thanks to our friends in Belarus and everybody in Europe and across the world uh, who is supporting their cause today. It's their struggle alone. Uh, but we stand with them. Thank you, Karen. Thanks so much, Dan. Those were really powerful remarks also about democracy. And I want to pick up the point you made, which is the main event today is hearing from our Eden members, Victoria, Alex, and Alex. And we wanted to start by having Brock and Derek and Dan talk about why they see this program as so powerful. And I think we heard clearly the commitment they all share to this. But you three are the main event. And I want to hand the role of moderator to my colleague, Jonathan Katz. And you've heard about Jonathan already from Brock and Derek and Dan and Jonathan is a senior fellow here. He's the director of democracy initiatives. And ever since he stepped through the front door of GMF, he has been an engine of expertise and enthusiasm for this region. So Jonathan, with that, let me give the floor to you. Karen, thank you. And also just thank you for your leadership on this, on, on these issues, the leadership issues, and for highlighting uh, the work also that our colleagues 
at GMF through leadership and civil society are doing. It's really important. Um, I just wanted to do one little piece of housekeeping. We are going to have a Q&A session, and uh, there's a Q&A button uh, at the, on the Zoom page. Please use that. We're hoping that you'll have some questions after we hear from the Eden members. Um, and so I just wanted to add that before jumping in. Sorry for that. I don't want to take away from all this great momentum. But I also wanted to just join Karen in uh, praising the work of USAID, Brock, I think uh, what was said, I think Dan said it about your legacy at USA. This is absolutely um, uh, so important and something that will have long-term impact. But also just to praise, you have two great partners in IRI and NDI that I work with um, on a daily basis. And so we're, we're really, uh, you couldn't pick two, two better partners to do what they're doing. And doing it, they obviously do it globally. Uh, but this is something that's so, so important. And so I just wanted to highlight that. And lastly, just one last point before uh, going to the Eden members, which is, is the bipartisan nature of the work that's being done. Um, it, it was pointed out that, that both Democrats, Republicans in the U.S. support this. I think we support it because this type of leadership, the investment in Eden members, is, and is an investment for the, you know, for the United States and others. The security, the success, uh, of countries like Belarus or Serbia or in Poland, absolutely come back to the success and security and future and democracy of the United States uh, and our partners as well. So uh, we're all in this together. There's numerous references to, I think that you pointed to that we all sort of, you know, we all, we all, um, we all benefit from working together. We also benefit from success. And when I think about the, the group that's here today, um, really just a super impressive uh, group. And uh, when we talk about Generation Next, we're actually really Generation Now. And so they're doing things now. And I look at their resumes. I'm not going to read the full bios, um, but I'm going to just speak a little bit to, their, uh, to some of the things that they're focused on. Uh, and then we're going to turn to Victoria, Alex, and Alex. Um, you mentioned, uh, Karen, early on, we have representatives from Belarus, Serbia, in Poland, and I wish we could have all Eden members on this as part of this conversation today, but we really have three great representatives. So if I can, if you can just bear with me, I'm just gonna sort of, I, I wanna read from their, um, from their resumes um, and some bios. Um, we have uh, Victoria uh, Andrukovic is, um, you know, obviously, Victoria, it's great that you're here today, um, you know, uh, representing, I think, uh, not only just yourself, but what's taking place uh, in Belarus today. Uh, you have an extensive background uh, working with uh, Belarusian human rights organizations, uh, working uh, through the political fields as well. I know you wanna to talk to, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you, speak to, uh, to, you know, to what's happening both in Belarus, but your efforts. Um, and uh, Dan and others pointed to the images and Derek did as well of what's taking place in Belarus today. And I think it was pointed out too that not only do we see uh, sort of youth engage or generation now engage, but it's also led by women in Belarus in such a significant way. So uh, you, you guys are an inspiration. Uh, we're watching closely. Um, and so uh, Victoria, we're, we really look forward to, to hearing from you uh, and to hearing from your, talking about your experience I also want to just bring in um, Alex uh, Savage, uh, who um, he himself also is um, a, a leading LGBTQ activist uh, in, in Serbia, but you're more than that. You're involved in next generation leadership. Um, Serbia has also undergone some, some difficult and challenging times. We didn't mention COVID-19. Your generation is experiencing challenges in a historic moment. Uh, Victoria, in your case, dealing both with you know COVID-19 and dealing with political change or seeking political change. It's extraordinary. Um, Alex, you, you are a leader in your own right. We're so pleased that you're here. Um, your resume has you working in uh, several different organizations, key organizations. Um, Serbia has undergone its own political uh, transitions, but also is admired in, in rallies and political protests but also looking very much to a democratic future. Um, and you're right in the middle of that. So uh, as an Eden member, but also in terms of what you're doing. 
and Alex Samerski in Poland. I didn't mean to leave you out uh, last but not least, uh, but you are an advisor to the mayor of Warsaw. You've worked in uh, ministry positions uh, with the EU parliament as well. Um, and I just want to thank you. I mean, Poland also um, has experienced its own challenges. It's democratically, but also in terms of transitions. Um, it's a country that uh, in some cases, when you look at Belarus and you look at Poland, you see the transitions that have taken place and who has led those transitions, uh, particularly in Poland, if you look back in sort of history, uh, you know the role of next generation leaders um, and you have a, there's a legacy, uh, you know, and that goes for both Poland, for Serbia, and now in Belarus too, all three of these countries. So um, just thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for joining. I think Dan, Derek, Karen, and Brock, all highlighted the tremendous things that you're doing, um, the challenges that, that you're facing, but also what you're bringing to the table today as leaders in your own right in your countries. So what I wanna do now is, Victoria, I wanted to turn it over to you first, uh, and then, um, then we'll go to Alex and Alex, uh, sort of picking up from there. Uh, Victoria, the floor is yours, and thank you so much again for being here, and we're, we're just, uh, you know, frankly, from seeing the work that you're doing, so proud uh, of what you're doing, but also we're thinking a lot about how we can best support both from the United States and elsewhere, because we're, we're part of a, a global effort to support youth leadership at, with IRI, NDI, USAID in the lead. Uh, so the, the floor is yours. I think we can everybody hear Victoria? Okay. No. Hold on a second. Um, do you have headphones, Victoria? Okay. Well, why don't we do this while we're waiting? Um, Alex, maybe we can go to you um, to, to kick us off and appreciate everybody's flexibility. And thank you again for, for joining and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Lakhan Dostavich and I come from Belgrade, Serbia. Um, I was born in 1992 and during the 90s life in the Balkans meant lots of wars, poverty, nationalism and dictatorship. And if you had to define the political situation in the region by one word, it would be division. There was no dialogue, freedom of press, or any kind of democracy. After the fall of Milosevic, democracy entered Serbia, but nationalism never left. There were brave activists that spoke against nationalism, hate, and denial of war crimes committed in our name during the 90s. But those people were labeled as enemies. Uh, we never learned about what really happened in schools. All we were taught by media and our politicians was to bring up what was done to us during the same period of time. I was always, uh, sorry, I always wondered why this narrative was forced on us from everywhere. These were all people and everyone involved in their murders should be punished. I never could imagine that one person should be murdered in my name. My parents would tell me stories about our friends from Croatia and Bosnia, and here we had a lot of family in Slovenia, but mass media and textbooks would refer to them as them and they never seemed like friends. I was 18 when I started learning about what really happened, about what they did to us and what we did to them. What also happened is that I was able to meet them and they seemed like friends and we all believed that our generation shouldn't allow nationalism and what someone else did to divide us. Um, it's been 10 years since then and <laughs> sounds like I'm getting old. Uh, but as I was getting older, I worked with many of them and we became friends and we worked together on many issues we found important. Today, as an LGBT activist, I can look back and see how much working with my fellow activists from all over the region gave to us. Our LGBT movement was always strong against wars of any kind. And during the 90s, queer people all over the region 
worked hard to protest wars, help victims, and bring awareness on how bad wars are. This regional solidarity was the key to 30 years of unstoppable fight for LGBT rights. And no, we do not live in equality and we're far from it, but we made progress. Today, each country in the region has a pride parade every year and we marched each pride together and we always will. And this is something we take a lot of pride in, but also something people can learn from. Sadly, not everything is so shiny and colorful today. Serbian democracy is once again fragile. Medias are being controlled by one man and they're doing it the same way, by dividing people. They're telling us that our neighbors are enemies, that everyone criticizing current regime is an enemy paid by EU or US, and people are falling for it. We're pointing fingers at each other while the real enemy is doing their work. And that is why Eden was so important to me. It was a chance for all of us to get out of our bubble and start speaking with people from different countries on, and different positions on political spectrum so that we can learn that we're not all so bad and we have common issues and goals. And that if we work together, we can build a better future for us and generations to come. During almost two years of being in Eden, many of my fellow members became elected officials or made it to their other positions that allowed them to do more. Others, I believe, are yet to achieve the same thing. This road will not be easy, but we are moving forward. We are, we are learning from our mistakes that previous generations made and we have no plan on stopping. And this is what I wanted my message to be. Do not point fingers at each other, build bridges instead of burning them. It is easy to blame everyone else, but trying to change something and talking with people will build a better society for all of us. Think about mistakes you made and take them as a lesson because that is what makes a change maker. Alex, uh, thank you for that. And also, you know, just inspired, uh, you've had success in addressing, you know, in a region that is also, that's really faced, just as you pointed out, you grew up in a period where there was extraordinary, extraordinary unrest and change that's still playing out uh, across this region. Uh, and it's important to know that you, you've had success and also that you're creating a, uh, a network across, uh, not only just in the region, not only in the Balkans, but with other partners who are participating with Eden, because that network is gonna be critical, as you said, um, you know, sort of going forward, you're not, there's no isolation. And so the network really expands and ensures that you're, you can tap into expertise. And I did want to point out what you did too, which is Eden members that are, that are moving into, um, into leadership positions or government positions right now. Uh, and so I think that's, that's extraordinary. And I suspect that maybe we'll, at some point we'll see you, your name as well. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, you know, maybe, uh, more uh, additionally involved politically, maybe in sort of a government position at some point down the road. But it just is a reminder that the investment today um, has uh, really pays dividends. And I think learning from your mistakes, I think that is both universal and ageless. That even, even, even I, you know, even having worked in sort of government and in these spaces for many years, is still learning from my own mistakes, trying to do things better. Um, but uh, we're all learning from you today, um, and I think that's incredibly important. Uh, Victoria, um, I think we I think we fixed the 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 technical glitch, and and thank you again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so we can just turn to you, and um, uh, you know, obviously Belarus is uh, so focally uh, such a focal point today uh, in the news, and and you are living through right now. Um, I think uh, Dan said. Is is one you know maybe one of the most important um, challenges right now uh, uh, you know sort of globally that people are following, but also it has a direct impact on the fight for democracy, freedom, and the right to choose political future. And that you know in Belarus you see such an extraordinary group of people from your age, women, to uh, images of of those that are in their seventies or eighties uh, protesting together. Uh, and so it's really something special. And one thing that we wanted to ask you to is to make sure you speak loud enough so we can, we can hear because the, the volume was a little bit, a little bit too low. Yeah, 
I hope you will hear me clearly. Yeah, thank you very much Perfect. for all your words of support and solidarity. It's really also a big inspiration for us Belarusians. And uh, well, I will start uh, with the fact that the entire electoral election campaign, which began on May 8th and lasted for three months, was uh, accompanied by massive repressions against public activists, independent journalists and bloggers. And uh, according to statistics of uh, human rights organizations, more than uh, one 1,500 uh, people were detained and from them 600 received administrative arrests and fine and also there was a number of criminal cases opened. Uh, so uh, by the 9th of August uh, we were having uh, 23 new political prisoners in the country uh, including presidential candidates, uh, members of the initiative groups, friends and even family members. And uh, of course all of you probably yeah, already have seen from the media what has happened. Uh, on the day of election and the week after. Uh, I did prepare a video, maybe uh, if John will be able to show it or I should uh, share my screen. Yeah, uh, well, uh, unfortunately it has um, a sense of violence, so this, uh, yes, there is a disclaimer. So on August 19th, uh, there was unprecedentedly massive, uh, massive peaceful protests in Belarus. Uh, peaceful were demanding uh, non-recognition of the official uh, results of the elections. And What was happening on the on the 9th of August? So uh, the authority responded to peaceful protests with a wave of mass uh, repressions, massive uh, violence, uh, torture, uh, enforced disappearances, rape, and killing of peaceful protesters. And uh, for three days, uh, from 9th to 12th of August, according to the official data. Uh, there were uh, 7,000 peaceful protesters detained and uh, um, almost every detainee reported uh, disproportionate use of force by law enforcement officers, torture and inability to report uh, their location to their relatives and lawyers. Uh, also, there were uh, um, our partners ISENS, as they provided uh, a report from uh, on the confidential medical data on the number of victims uh, that uh, victims of actions of the security forces uh, in Belarus during those uh, suppressions of the protest. And according to the official data, there were about uh, 350 people who were forced to seek emergency medical care. Uh, and uh, it was uh, unprecedented uh, case in Belarus in terms of uh, uh, brutality. Uh, of the detention. And also it's very important to notice that uh, not only violence was used during the detention, but also during the, uh, in the detention center in prisons where people were kept. And um, uh, the investigation shows us if there were injuries of, uh, with the, uh, where, which were made by uh, the usage of police, uh, batons, uh, also uh, gunshot wounds, uh, also uh, um, Injuries that were made by stun grenades, thermal burns, chemical burns of high toxic poisoning of the body, and more and much more. And besides the majority of patients, they were diagnosed with combined and multiple injuries, which uh, shows and proves that uh, the person continued to be beaten even after she or he had already received injuries. And uh, also, the proof of the uh, level of uh, violence also was the fact that some uh, actually there was also some cases of uh, sexual violence and uh, injuries that indicated that uh, people were um, raped with hard objects in order to police buttons. So uh, and all this of course it's uh, we're not already speaking about uh, regular violation of human rights it's already uh, lots of criminal cases. And the protests, they continue still today, as well as protest, protests so usually takes place uh, each Sunday. And uh, each Sunday, statistically, over 600 people are detained through the country. 
uh, mostly all of them are released in two days. So they do not uh, say about any tortures. However, again, the detention itself is quite violent. And again, then they are brought to administer responsibility and they have to pay large fines. And uh, in most court cases scenario, um, they face uh, criminal liability and have to flee the country. Uh, and um, well, I would speak here probably of yeah, and uh, yeah, all these uh, horrible things that I have shown and I have said, apart from this, we have also positive things such as uh, that we have not only, there were not only unprecedented level of violence, but unprecedented level of facilitation of the society after such an event. And uh, personally, I, and I do believe uh, the majority of Belarusians would say that our society has never been as uh, united as right now. And right now we all uh, work in cooperation and the civil society became uh, the major driving force and we cooperate with each other. And there is, an, uh, again, the civil society is not represented only by NGOs, but also by regular people who want to uh, help. And uh, um, so uh, at, my, uh, at uh, my human rights organization, and not only, like, again, I was told that we are working in cooperation, we provide free legal, financial, psychological, and medical assistance. Medical assistance, again, like there are some private clinics that, uh, that uh, proposed to people uh, help free of charge. And uh, we also established comedy for investigation of torture committed against participants of peaceful rallies in Belarus. And we're trying to collect as much as possible facts and evidence uh, so that the perpetrators will, uh, are brought to justice. Um, so what do we do also? What is also organized is fundraising. Uh, so no one is left without uh, help and support. So the victims of violence, definitely, and their fam families in case they need any kind of uh, financial, psychological support. Uh, also, uh, the ones who were detained, uh, we, have, uh, we are providing always a lawyer, so they are always protected completely free of charge and it's not uh, let's say a uh, pro-state lawyer that is given by the state and is in, uh, not protecting uh, actual right of the protester. Uh, also uh, um, there is our system of covering the fines uh, that uh, that's uh, the protesters face because they're quite large and uh, besides uh, we support people workers in the factory that uh, uh, that are let's say strikes right now is one of the main tools that actually way which which can actually affect our authorities. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, again, like people are uh, under big pressure who actually go for that. Uh, and the, for example, the, the head of the strike committees in our plant, they had to flee to already, unfortunately. And uh, so there is a big pressure and also stress to their families. Um, we also provide help to the ones who lost their jobs or, or, or because of their political views or quit uh, the, themselves uh, because they didn't want to engage in falsification of elections or results of elections or uh, anything that contributes to the property of the regime. And um, yes, and also I would admit that there is uh, a huge solidarity movement that uh, also works uh, across the border and like we also in touch with our diasporas and uh, personally, I, I live for quite a while in Lithuania and I'm in touch with uh, Belarusian diaspora in Lithuania. And uh, at the moment there are 70 political refugees there and uh, all of them, they were accommodated completely free of charge and people are helping as much as possible for them to uh, find their place in new society and uh, go through this hard period. So I would say that uh, what is actually very important uh, right now for Belarusians is, uh, as a political level, it is uh, development uh, by the international community a joint strategy to combat illegal uh, seizure of power by Alexander Lukashenko and his servants. And the second thing is to support Belarusian people in struggle for their civil rights. Uh, of course, we urge not to recognize the results of presidential elections and uh, to withhold presidential elections in accordance with international uh, electoral standards, uh, release of political prisoners that unfortunately are still in, uh, kept in the very hard conditions. Um, and uh, also uh, to, we urge to stop persecution of journalists and activists who are still in big danger. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, so the point is also, I would say that speaking about Eden is uh, the support it gives to the use. And uh, I would say that, uh, again, like in, in my organization, the majority is young people uh, who are trying to make a change, who are actually trying to make something bigger. Uh, and uh, they are all quite ambitious. And what do we need is actual resources to uh, implement what do, what do we want to achieve and we'll like to change the society in a way that it will be uh, genuinely democratic. So I would say that's a very important point here is to support civil society generation, uh, civil society <laughs> organization, sorry. Um, and uh, as well as independent media and uh, bloggers in Belarus that would provide objective media coverage. And uh, uh, another thing I would like to mention, there is uh, still ongoing, let's say, this kind of stop inter uh, soft interference from the side of Russia, because on the 15th uh, of August, they were meeting of Lukashenko and Putin, and he provided a uh, one and a half million uh, uh, loan uh, that actually would support uh, uh, and uh, for the persecution, detention and torture uh, people in Belarus. So I would say that, uh, and besides, um, Putin also provides some kind of political support and diplomatic one to Lukashenko by approving of his constitutional reforms that, that he's trying to uh, trying to implement in the country. And again, the media. The media right now, like our uh, national TV, it's completely, um, as is, uh, like they, especially from Russia today, uh, they are working on our media and there is a lot of propaganda on TV. So again, like it's some kind of uh, interventions that we cannot, uh, we are trying to get rid because, you know, like people right now, they are trying not to support the system as much as possible economically and uh, lead to some kind of uh, level when uh, they won't be able to uh, financially maintain their security forces. Yeah, so thank you very much. I'm sorry if it was long. No, Victoria, thank you. And it, it's, it's just a reminder that, that, you know, we talk about leadership, you're in the middle of this right, of this crisis right now, this political crisis. Uh, thank you for sharing the, the pictures and, and video. And um, I think the solidarity, there's a tremendous amount of solidarity. I know on sort of this, um, at this event today with what's happening. And I know there are others thinking about how best to engage and support uh, support that effort. But I want to thank you because you're, you know, obviously you're, you're doing a tremendous amount of work. Um, and I think you pointed out that, that the challenges facing you and sort of the, those that, are, that are, are working to seek political change is being met by not only resistance, but also uh, a challenge is a need for resources. And I know one of the questions uh, that will probably come up um, is, is what, you know, what uh, youth leaders need, and I think it could be very specific to the moment, which you're going through right now. Um, and I'm glad that you raised uh, sort of these issues and helped us walk through uh, what's taking place. I, you don't really have the luxury of, of sort of even developing leadership over, you know, sort of this extended period. You're in it right now. So, um, and I know we're going to turn to Alex Hamersky next. next. Uh, you talked about a network of countries that are also uh, uh, bordering Belarus, uh, sort of playing a role, uh, also facing their own, their own challenges, uh, you know, in terms of generationally, uh, and, and whether it's Poland, uh, but, but certainly, um, Alex, uh, Mierski, you've been involved in, uh, obviously, uh, working for the mayor of Warsaw, um, also um, significant political issues, uh, deep challenges, you have regional challenges as well, um, and within Poland and the region are challenges to, to democracy and to the future of the region. And that has a direct impact on, uh, on what happens in places like Belarus or in, um, in Serbia and the Balkans, because Poland has been a model of, of successful transition that was largely fueled as well by youth, younger leaders, next generation leaders. Uh, somebody brought up uh, the 1989 generation and I think uh, with all the stresses on democracy today and the stresses on you and your generation, um, we're really looking forward to hearing from you as to, uh, as to you know, so from your perspective, 
um, you know, how both, both Eden, but also the work that you're doing is, is reshaping uh, the political and democracy landscape. So Alex, thank you for being so patient. Um, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to see so many people um, at this event because in and, of, in and of itself, that is a significant statement. It means that there is a great deal of genuine positive interest in the youth. I would try to be rather general and sweeping in my remarks. And as the point of departure, I would like to make an obvious observation. Since the uh, end of the Poland, uh, Polish People's Republic, which you mentioned, Jonathan, which came to an end in 1989, we've had almost two entire political generations that have grown up. And the world in which we live in is completely different now. We take independence for granted. Look at what's happening in Belarus. We have global connectivity. You have the possibility to share any piece of information instantly all over the world via social media. But there is also a great discrepancy between what we were promised by our parents and that and the world we live in. We entered the job market after the economic crisis of 2008 and the rate of unemployment among our generation is often double the average. We've, we've grown up certain that we will be the ones changing the world and that we deserve only the best things in life. Whereas in reality, we are rejected by companies. We're told that there is no place for us. And only a few years earlier, we were told that everything is going to be fine and that everything's going to work out. We are by far the most highly educated generation in the history of the, of the entire world. We, but we also have a natural tendency to go to war with the older generations. We were promised everything and given nothing by our parents. We deeply believe in authenticity and being authentic. We tend to dismiss parties that were set up by previous generations. More often than not, we don't consider voting for them. And we will pursue authenticity at any cost, even if it means voting for populists. And by the way, we don't believe a word they say. So I'm not surprised that we're sitting here talking about this. Are you? Alex, uh, thank you for, you know, for your comments too. And I just, uh, the, the generation gaps and, and intra, generation communication, economic issues. Um, if, you know, obviously the challenges after 2008, 2009 were grave globally. And you think about COVID-19 now and another generation that's about to and is experiencing a very similar type of, of challenge. Um, it's difficult, but also um, cynicism and sort of, and cynicism and, and disinformation and um, you're the, you're also the most tech savvy generation as well. Um, and I think one of the things that will come up too is, is the ability to cut through the din, cut through the disinformation, um, and seeking, you know, sort of what's real to me, real is authentic, you know, in the sense of, you know, actually being truthful. Um, and so it's interesting that you said, you know, you don't believe the populace. And so I, I think, you know, the challenge is how do you gain the trust in, in your generation and generation coming after to be able to want to participate, to uh, realize, I think it was mentioned earlier, that democracy is, is a constant struggle. Um, and, uh, and that makes it imperfect. Uh, and, uh, and I think successive generations uh, experience this. Uh, but I think um, there's been a couple of really significant shock waves uh, over, this last, over this last decade that are extraordinary. So um, what I wanted to do now is, is to, you know, to open it up to, to questions. And I, I actually wanted to turn to, to Brock Bierman to, to kick us off for this, the Q&A session. And what I wanted to do too is just remind everybody who's participating online to feel free to, to join us uh, and, and sort of offering some questions. Uh, and you know, uh, we really appreciate all of your participation, but we want to hear from you. So Brock, uh, sending it over to you. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, first off, I, I would like to uh, thank both Alex's uh, for their comments uh, and inspiration. But truly, uh, Victoria, um, the work that you were doing is, is truly inspiring. And, you know, I, I said this in Berlin last year to all of you. Uh, look, uh, I, I think I speak for Dan and, and I think I speak for Derek and Jonathan and Karen and all, the entire team. Uh, we have your back. We're going to be here. 
and we're going to support your efforts, uh, whether it's in Belarus or anywhere in any of your countries, uh, we are going to do what it takes to support your democratic aspirations. Uh, but we, but I, I think in terms of some of the, the issues that I'm interested in hearing from you specifically on are some of the hurdles uh, to getting young people engaged. And I think uh, during both uh, Derek and Dan's opening, they, they talked about the importance of increased youth participation. And so I guess my, my thinking is in terms of asking the Eden participants, what more can we do? What, what else can we do? What are those hurdles that are keeping young people from being involved? I realize we, we live in a 24 hour news cycle. We realize social media and there's dis disinformation. But in, in this time of important uh, democratic work that needs to be done, what else can we do to get uh, more young people engaged? Thanks. Uh, Jonathan, can I hear you? Sorry about that. Um, I think what we'll do right now, maybe we'll just start with, with Alex Paul and Poland, uh, maybe to, to, you know, to respond and then we'll go, you know, I hope all three of you would have a an answer because we certainly want to hear from you uh, to, in response to Brock. So Alex, over to you. Thank you. So I've asked around, I've asked around uh, people from my generation, also from the, from the generation of, of our parents, and I've essentially identified three issues that we, we need help with. So the first one is, is an exchange, a, a transition between the generations. So we need a way for more young people to get involved to slowly replace what, what Jonathan, you called, um, or sorry, uh, was it someone else? Uh, the, the old guard, right? So you want to rotate. The second thing is that there, there seems to be a glass ceiling. So whatever, however uh, able you are, you just can't get past a certain point. And then lastly, there is the, our background growing up. So we kind of need to be able to deal with that and to kind of psychologically prepare for, for what's ahead. Can we, Victoria, can we turn to you as well? Yes, I can. Uh, I would, uh, first of all, I would say that, for example, it's very important to give a chance to speak up for these, like we're doing right now. So it's actually like have this connection, being able to share what we're actually doing from the grassroots level. And uh, maybe yeah, being able to uh, also affect uh, like political affairs, for example, in, in, in Belarus, definitely like we cannot, but here, I think like in case of Poland, that actually, for example, young voices would be heard and why young voices would be also making some difference uh, in political affairs is very important. The second thing I would say that uh, at the moment uh, it would be at least for our country it's important to provide some kind of educational platform that also will give uh, people a uh, chance not only to improve their skills but to gain some experience that actually will make uh, them change their mind in a way that um, in Belarus many people they cannot afford for example like simple traveling and they have never seen anything but Belarus and uh, for them, it's very, I mean, it's uh, actually, from my experience, I've been uh, to several trainings for young leaders and uh, some Belarusians, for, for the first time, it's uh, eye-opening experience and it, it's seen and it's very inspiring and actually makes them believe that they have to, in, it's also sharing experience is very important and also networking events that actually makes us, uh, yeah, this, is it, even actually it's network. So I would say, for example, the Eden members from Belarus whom I met, uh, it was a nice surprise because some of them, they were my group mates from the university uh, each year, European Humanities University in Salon Vilnius. And right now, Mary, we are all connected here in Belarus because we're in back actually to, um, uh, yeah, to cooperate, to work together on the same issues. Uh, and so uh, this is what I would say the, the main things yeah, to provide. In terms of resources, I think, uh, yes, uh, I, I know that uh, even also provides grants and uh, also financial support to actually uh, implement our activities in Southern State and it's also important. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. And, and I'm going to turn to, um, to, you know, to, to Alex in, in, uh, in Serbia next, but I, and I also wanted to ask him too, when you hear what Alex and Victoria are both talking about the issue of transition, 
replacing, you know, um, young leaders being able to transition and replace uh, old guard and that, you know, that there, there's, there's a challenge of sort of uplifting sort of young leaders. Um, and we hear about uh, sort of points made by Victoria. Is that something you do you share their, their, their insights and needs and what else, what more do you think uh, should and could be done to, you know, to, to support and strengthen uh, both youth leadership, but also engagement, because I'm hearing one of the questions that we received too is um, a bit of cynicism towards Alex about um, in Poland about what you said about populists that people will just vote for populists, you know, because they're so frustrated. But more often than not, those populists are pulling democracy uh, in, in, in the wrong direction. You see tremendous backsliding. Uh, Freedom House annual index of of, of democracy shows countries like Poland and Serbia also moving, you know, in the wrong direction, not forward, because people perceive or looking at populist leaders weakening, whether it's rule of law or uh, or independent media. So, I, Alex, I just wanted you to maybe to jump in and talk about just responding to what you hear from your your colleagues, and if, if you feel like they're sort of pointing out the things that, that you think that need to be needed, and, and what more. Sure. Thank so, you, Jonathan. Oh, was it me? Alex, uh, Alex and other, other Alex, and then we can come back to you too, Alex, because I want to, in, in, uh, in Warsaw, because I want to also sort of pick up uh, on sort of some of the things that, that you said, Alex, uh, in Serbia. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think the first and the biggest issue is that uh, politics are being perceived as something that's necessarily negative. And people do need to realize, especially young people, that it's not uh, about politics, it's about people who do politics. And there are different ways to do different, uh, to do politics. And um, I, I mean, my big example is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who obviously brought this new way of doing pol politics, engaging with people and doing your thing um, by, and also overcoming all these other issues because I mean, not all candidates have the same resources, but I think also young people are first afraid that they are not perfect and the reality is no one is and you're allowed to make mistakes. That's gonna be perfectly fine. And they're also afraid to speak up on certain issues because they think that they will never gain support for these. Um, being a gay man, I mean, I know how hard it is for politicians to say that they support LGBT rights in Serbia. But the, the thing is also by, by claiming certain values, you will gain the, the, the support. And what we can do as a network, we can provide mentorship for these people. We can uh, show them the good examples all over the world of people making political careers from nothing and actually making a change. And I think that's a very important thing to do. And this is something um, in my career as an activist was very important to actually get to know people, to, to learn from, from their careers. Alex, did you want to come in too um, uh, in, in Warsaw? Because I, you know, I, I, I mentioned, I mentioned, um, you know, some of the, um, that one of the questions was really kind of responding to, to you, uh, maybe also sort of expressing some concerns. I mean, but I, I think it, what you pointed out was it maybe a challenge to overcome, which is there's cynicism about leadership. And, um, and I'm wondering how you know, certain leadership, um, populist leadership, uh, and populism can mean a lot of things. The definition is used a lot. So how are, you, how are you thinking about overcoming amongst your peers cynicism and putting the cynicism into action to achieve the objectives that you, that you seek? So over to you, Alex. Thank you. So I think there's a great cause for optimism, and this has been shown throughout the recent presidential elections in Poland. We've seen uh, over the last few months unprecedented engagement from the youth supporting um, one, of, one of the candidates. Uh, and we've seen posters, we've seen own initiatives, we've seen so much work done just because people had nowhere, um, no, nowhere to become engaged and suddenly this opportunity shows up and they're just going nuts. They're doing things left and right. They're doing them throughout the day, throughout the night. They're coming to events, they're singing anthems, they're, they're making their own songs. So I think th there is great 
I hope uh, just over the horizon. Thank you again. Um, I think you know, sort of overcoming those issues in, in Victoria, I wanted to just bring you sort of back in as well um, and, and maybe talk to you about, you know, I, I mean, I like, I, I'm, Alex, I'm, you know, buoyed by, by optimism that, that you talk about and some of the questions we've had about our sort of millennials that are not, you know, that are not um, engaged. It's been part of the problem. Somebody even pointed to the recent election uh, in Poland for president as perhaps that there's a ceiling for, uh, you know, candidates on sort of one side of the political aisle to be able to achieve objectives that if only if the youth were more engaged um, and if that youth vote came out that you could break, maybe potentially break that glass ceiling. In Belarus, you're seeing, you know, uh, a next generation trying to, um, after 26 years of dictatorship, Victoria, I assume that's your entire life has been under the rule of Lukashenko. Yeah. And, um, but I wanted to ask about how did your generation uh, within this system get to where, to the point where it is right now, where you're leading uh, and uh, leading efforts within Bel Belarus um, with others, um, this charge for political change? Because I think it's, it's a lesson uh, because I think there were many um, and there was a stereotype that this couldn't, you know, that this type of change you wouldn't see in Belarus. And maybe you can just give us a little bit of insight for yourself, how you, how you were able to sort of build up uh, the courage, I think that I hear from all of you, to take the leap and step out uh, in a system that's been so repressive. And I think Brock said it, uh, it's inspiring to hear about what you're doing and about the courage. And I think this goes for all three of the the three of you who are speaking today in, in sort of different ways, but yours is so acute and such a, as we said, you know, in 2020, one of the most monumental changes is what's taking place in Belarus. So maybe you could just speak to that and, and how, you know, what, what's inspired you. Cause I want to also to talk to you about maybe the three of you too, about what, what, what are your inspirations, you know, and, um, and, and sort of the successes that, that, that help, uh, keep you going. Victoria, over to you. And also, just please try to keep your um, yeah, yeah, microphone. Thank you. Sorry yes, for that. Thank you. Uh, well, I would say that uh, speaking about the fear, well, yeah, it's a big obstacle on our way. But at the same time, uh, I would say that uh, it fades away when you feel this, uh, sense, when you have the sense of unity, when you feel that you're not alone in this struggle and uh, actually there are a lot of support there is a big community of amazing people and usually you know like all the volunteers all the people that are coming they uh, most of their share our values they already have a very different mentality i would say that yes we are people that were uh, that we've seen only you know uh bellers that were ruled uh, by lukashenko but at the same time i think maybe it also makes us think that we don't want it to continue we actually want to see our country different and we i think and people deserve it and when you also you know like if uh, it's i would say that the main inspiration is actually people around when you see those faces and you understand that they actually deserve it they deserve to have a better place to live they deserve to uh, express the opinion that deserve to have a better life and I mean I lived for in Lithuania for that long time I could stay there I came here so I would say that it's mostly about people it's mostly about uh, everybody who right now eager to turn this country into something better and we actually have a potential for it yes I, I hope I answered the question yeah, um, and I think we just we want to hear about the things that that uh, that inspire you, and then uh, you know how you how you turn it into uh, in, you know into action. Uh, and um, and I, I did want to go back to the question of you know of of things that 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 could be helpful going forward. But I also wanted to bring up one other you know sort of question for you is about the about the challenges of of polarization, you know, how you approach, um, you know, uh, when I look at Poland, it's deeply polarized, right? It's, it's a polarized society with, uh, with strong opposing uh, political views on both sides. Uh, Alex in Belgrade too, just um, you're dealing with an issue that, you know, even Serbia is also, you know, polarized. We see this globally. 
Uh, Belarus, um, it also has it internally, but, but it's, it's, it's being reshaped, uh, sort of what internally people want and what they're seeking. And I just wanted to ask, uh, particularly sort of Alex and Alex about this issue of polarization and also uh, something that your generation is dealing with, which is brought up before, uh, which is the issue of disinformation and how you are helping your generation and others. And I think it's not just, um, you know, uh, again, I mentioned the most tech savvy uh, generation that you are helping all of us overcome uh, uh, constant disinformation. And I think that's really important. So maybe I can talk to, you know, maybe talk to Alex and Morsa about polarization or how do you, how do you reach out to those on, on the opposite side, even amongst your peers um, to, to have the type of dialogue that's, that's needed because in many respects, Poland has, it does have generational politics right now. When you look at the leadership in Poland and who's behind the leading uh, sort of the, the, the party that is um, in charge of the government, it's very much connected deeply to Poland's past. Um, and so maybe we'll speak to that and then Alex uh, will pull you in as well. But I also wanted you guys to, to talk about this, this disinformation challenge, which is in, infecting political views at, at all, all generational levels. So Alex, over to you, Morsa. Thank you. So Poland has always been between a rock and a hard place. And if you could, if you look at the majority of Polish history, we were always strong when we were together and we were weak and we even disappeared from the maps for, for 123 years when we were divided. So I think it, our history is a great lesson and, and a great example for others to not have to learn this the hard way and to realize that, you know, despite the differences we might have on the surface, we are a great and proud nation. And to this end, we could look at the Americans, at you guys, and, and learn a few things. First of all, look at democracy as the ability to compete, but also to cooperate and to be able to, you know, make the call, a genuine call to the person that you've, you've lost the election uh, against and honestly congratulate them. And, and a sense of that kind of um, working uh, above the aisle is something that we need, I believe, in Poland right now. Alex in Belgrade? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking, you know, um, lately, I, I, I just a few days ago, I saw this TED Talks video about how social media gained from polarization and how much they pit, pit us against each other. And I think that shows that these modern technologies, as good as they are for us, should also have their bad sides. And I think that actually uh, fighting against polarization can be done by actually going back to basics and talking to people, you know, one on one or smaller groups and seeing people uh, talking to people directly instead of only relying on social media. And even though that's way slower, it's also, I think, more efficient. So that is that is how I see fighting polarization because um, it doesn't do us any good. You know, it's just plenty of people fighting and never finding the common goal. Yeah, one, one, one person at a time. Victoria, did you want to, do you want to come in on, this, on these topics? Uh, well, I can add some words. I would say that uh, the problem of polarization, which did exist in our society, I cannot say that it was com it was completely solved after the, um, what has happened on the 19th of August uh, and after it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like I think many people, they finally understood that we have one and the same enemy. If before there were problems with, uh, actually opposition was very marginalized by others. Lots of people were afraid of them. They were saying that they are nationalists and et cetera, and they were barely believing uh, in their words and et cetera. But, Right now, I would say that people with very different views on polit political views, very different. Uh, so they are actually connected right now. And yeah, it's kind of very strange to recognize that this violence that actually makes us united in the way because, you know, like when there is something inhuman happens that we actually understand that, you know, like we are just one and the same and we need to support each other. And information, yeah, we have a lot of propaganda in Belarus from the side of Russia in particular, but I think, yeah, again, it's um, 
I think it's a uh, very important that right now use we have uh, a sources uh, of um, independent media mostly because we know for example like during the time was when there were no internet in Belarus uh, so we actually were changing VPN and IP addresses so that actually to have proper sources and we were sharing information with uh, people of older generation who have uh, uh, access only to national media, which was saying that, you know, like there are provocators on the street and they are, uh, you know, like uh, beating the security forces, officials and etc. So, yeah, and it also comes from families and from the experience. And at the moment, mostly each Belarusian uh, has a person who actually suffered from the whole situation and that also made an impact because you know like when you have already personal experience with that you already think differently mm -hmm. when it's just not when it's not a picture from the media when it's actual experience yeah i think the efforts uh by by yourself and others on communications and media and and belarus right now is um one support for independent media really important but also for technologies to to uh, enable people to communicate freely and openly and transparently is so important. Can I ask you, Victoria, have you been able to just during this moment sort of reach out as this is happening? Or are you receiving uh, sort of engagement from other Eden members? Have you been able to tap, you know, into that network? Because I also foresee, you know, uh, you know, I see your colleagues here too. Um, and, you know, if there's political transition, which is what, what uh, people are protesting for, you can see the, you know, political transition also involves so many things, including competing ideas about what uh, Belarus might look like, uh, you know, going going forward in terms of everything from economic issues, which are really important because Belarus faces significant economic challenges, health challenges. Um, but have you been able to tap into the network? Because I think um, just sort of listening to your, your colleagues today, knowing the Eden network, but also the support of NDI, IRI, and, and USAID, um, it's, it's a big network. So maybe you just speak a little bit to that. And I wanted to ask each one of you too, before we turn back to, uh, quickly, uh, turn back to, um, to, to Karen, uh, Dan Brock, uh, and, uh, Derek, uh, for closing. But I wanted to ask you about that because I think it just goes to the heart of Eden, uh, in that network. Over to you, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that actually, uh, uh, in a way that uh, before the, what has happened during the uh, post elections, also post election in, uh, events, I was involved in to work at the platform for uh, a monitoring of electoral process in Belarus. Uh, and it was actually supported by NDI uh, to a big regard. And we were very grateful because we were provided with uh, space to work. We have, we had like a huge, uh, we had like, around 140 volunteers, students of each year mostly. It, 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 took, it uh, took place in Vilnius. And uh, yeah, it, it actually supported us a lot in that way. Whether I, uh, and the question was whether I also shared uh, information about EDN among my colleagues, right? Well, and also how, you, how are you communicating with, with your EDN network, what's taking oh. place? And are, are you able to access um, sort of the incredible talents and experiences to help help you and those that your peers that are experiencing this right now because when i see the network and you see who's in it uh, you have just this tremendous group that um, can be helpful and will likely be helpful um you know in in the coming days and months uh well we are in touch via telegram so we're actually sharing a lot of things with each other i would not say that like we have like a very strong cooperation right now but I do believe that, you know, like when something will happen, so we will be always, uh, you know, there to help each other. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Alex and Alex just too quickly, just for maybe, you know, final words. And when you're, you're hearing, you're seeing what's happening with Victoria and, and sort of in, in Belarus and what's taking place, uh, but also the challenges that you face, you know, how you're tapping into uh, the Eden network, what more do you think you could do within this network that would be helpful uh, to partners, whether they're in Belarus or Warsaw or Belgrade. So Alex and, and Belgrade, can I turn to you? Well, of course. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, this network is a huge opportunity and really there is not one way to benefit from it, but 
you need to, to kind of take and ask for what, what you need. And I think that's very important. Just the other day, my colleague Milan uh, emailed us telling us that he will be visiting Kosovo for the first time and he would like to meet our members from there, uh, you, you know, and have a coffee with them. And I think, you know, that is a great example on um, how bringing us together is important because most of the young people in Serbia never went to Pristina or Kosovo. They did not realize um, how different it is. And I, I think it's groundbreaking for them to do so because I've been taking these young people to, to, to Pristina every year. And I mean, this is just a small example. You know, we built so many friendships, we share issues. And I mean, I can very much relate to, to Victoria's story in Belarus because I mean, just the other day I was reading this article from an LGBT activist from Belarus and how it feels for them to be the part of the protest. And I mean, all these issues are something we can re more or less relate to, but we are fighting the same enemy. And that is something, you know, it, you need, do need to realize who your real enemy is because we point fingers at each other uh, over small things while we can actually work together and solve the, the real issues. Thanks. Alex Warsaw. So uh, you mentioned disinformation, but I think that the, the big problem right now is that what the public perceives to be a reality is just a bunch of slogans. And we see this very often that people are just repeating slogans. Uh, so, I mean, look, look at COVID, look at the 5G situation. People are like literally tearing down masks, 5G masks. Look at Brexit. We had, I, I don't remember the exact number, but thousands of targeted messages sent per every inhabitant, per every voter. Uh, misinformation about Brexit. So, I mean, check your sources, but also be aware of this, that this is happening. All right, Alex, thank you. Um, and thank you all three of you for your, your leadership. Thank you for taking time, uh, you know, to join us, to provide us your, both your stories, uh, what you're working on, how we can do a better job uh, as, as partners together, working together to strengthen democracy, but also uh, to cut through the din as well, what Alex just said too about, about slogans that we have to get to the, to the real issues and then sort of work towards them. And it's never easy. It's always incredibly hard. So if I could, I'm going to turn back to uh, my colleague, Karen Donfried uh, and uh, other colleagues to, to, uh, to, to close this out. Karen. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And let me just give a round of thank yous. Uh, Brock, Thank you so much for your initiative and leadership here. Dan and Derek, I can't think of better partners for USAID on this than IRI and NDI. Jonathan, thanks to you for being my uh, partner at GMF on this event. And to all of you who are listening, it has been great to have such a large audience for this session. And I'm just delighted that you are ending the week on a high note with all of us. And I know you join me and Jonathan and Brock and Derek and Dan in wanting to pay tribute to Victoria, Alex and Alex. It is not only super interesting to hear from you, but it's also motivating. So thanks to the three of you for all you are doing in your respective countries. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. And uh, again, uh, as Karen said, just thank you for joining. We look forward, Brock, to hosting you guys again, you, Derek, Dan, and these groups. And we look forward to keeping in touch with everybody. So uh, on that note, uh, have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, thank Alex, you. Victoria. Alex. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone, and thank you very much for everything. See you all soon. Thank you.